I've lived in this township my whole life. My purpose clear. But now I would risk everything, my life, my ministry, my soul, just to spend a few moments alone with you. Demi Moore and Gary Oldman fight the temptation of a forbidden love, but not very hard, in a new version of the American classic, The Scarlet Letter, updated for the 1990s. It's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with Linda Fiorentino and David Caruso in the new thriller Jade, and also Harvey Keitel, Roseanne, and Madonna in an improvised comedy. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is The Scarlet Letter, and right away I'm going to have to object to its happy ending, which is miles away from the original ending in the classic novel by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I just don't think you can play this fast and loose with classics. Demi Moore stars as the married Hester Prynne, who arrives in puritanical Massachusetts in 1666 without her husband, and immediately is excited at the sight of the local preacher bathing in the nude, another plot point not in the book. After hearing his sermon, they meet once again. It's rare for a man so young to speak with such a force of passion. Well, for some reason, I, I felt most inspired today. That's Gary Oldman as the Reverend Arthur Dimsdale, and soon he and Hester acknowledge the intensity of their feelings. Say something to end it, for I, I have no the power. Nor I. After hearing reports that her husband, upon arriving in America, was killed by Indians, Hester cannot delay acting out her love for the Reverend. Hester ends up having a baby and is soon censored by the town leaders. Mistress, if you do not speak out the name, you must wear upon your bodice this symbol of your sinful fornication. Actually, the best character in the film is a supporting player. Joan Plowright plays Mistress Hibbins, accused of being a witch, but she merely senses the passion in Hester. But I can see what others cannot. Be a curse, to be sure but I know the hearts of men. The rest of the movie, however, holds our attention only for a little while with Demi Moore's passion, but then the filmmakers really twist Hawthorne's story like a pretzel as writer Douglas Day Stewart has to find a way to bring about a more upbeat ending. Whole scenes are invented involving nudity and Indian attacks and the life and death of central characters. In so doing, a landmark novel becomes a conventional movie the more I thought about it, this movie is closer to pretty women <laughs> than the real Scarlet Letter. You know, from a Hollywood point of view, the problem with Nathaniel Hawthorne's novel is that it begins after the adultery is already over, which okay. is kind of like, it's kind of like telling Salome's story after she puts the veils back on. And so, of course, they go back for all of that soft core stuff that looks like it comes out right. of a Playboy video. And another thing that really bothers me in the novel, it's the Reverend Dimsdale, who is really the hypocrite. Not only did he father the child, but he, he fans up the local protest against this wo woman as a way of kind of concealing his own guilt. And right. in this movie, they make him more of a kind of a regretful That's bystander. Right. This movie has no sense of sin, no sense of guilt. It's just kind of a, a, a propaganda film for letting it all hang out in, uh, in puritanical Eng uh, New England. The, um, I never thought I'd say this, but actually, Cliff Notes, you know, the crib sheets that people would read when yeah, they were assigned uh, books like uh, The Scarlet Letter in high school, yeah. that's more valuable than this movie. Not only is this film not The Scarlet Letter, it's really not much of anything else either. Okay. All right, flight directors, I want the go, no, go for launch. Retro. Go flight. Booster. Go flight. Hey, Harry, you know we're sitting on four million pounds of fuel, one nuclear weapon, and a thing that has 200,000 moving parts. Go flight the lowest and bitter. The clock is ticking and Bruce Willis is on a mission to save the world from a giant asteroid in Armageddon. One of the movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, and we'll take a look at the newly restored version of Gone with the Wind. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Armageddon is appropriately named because while you're seeing it, you will feel as though you've been in combat, visual combat and oral combat. This could have been the movie that was shown to Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange to make him sick of violence. <laughs> Am I communicating? We're talking non-stop action and noise. That doesn't make it a bad movie. Rather, the audacity of the way it has been put together eventually becomes almost amusing. The situation is this. An asteroid the size of Texas is hurtling toward Earth. Deep Corps oil driller Bruce Willis is called upon by NASA Chief Billy Bob Thornton 
to help save the world. We're a little short on time here. Will you help us? All they got to do is drill. That's it. No spacewalking, no crazy astronaut stuff. Just drill. So Willis recruits his own men, including Ben Affleck and Steve Buscemi. Their mission, land two space shuttles on the big rock, drill holes for nuclear bombs, and blow the sucker off its trajectory. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? Regarding the human element in the film, as little as there is, I was struck by the impact of young actress Liv Tyler as Willis' daughter and Ben Affleck's girlfriend. Do you think it's possible that anyone else in the world is doing this very same thing at this very same moment? I hope so. Otherwise, what the hell are we trying to save? Now, each element of their plan serves as its own action film, and director Michael Bay, whose last picture was The Rock, which also was strikingly noisy, dares us to relax in Armageddon. Armageddon is blaringly intense. By the end, I didn't care whether Earth was saved as much as I wanted to survive myself. But again, if you get into this mood with this picture, I was laughing. That's a strangely entertaining and amusing experience. If you can stop blinking and, of course, take your fingers out of your ears. So a weird, truly weird thumbs up from me. Well, we saw the same picture, but my thumb is way down. I wanted to escape from this movie. I didn't I care if the asteroid hit, hit the Earth or not. I was afraid the movie was going to hit me. And, you know, yeah, it it's you. cut so quickly Absolutely. that there's no uh, a stretch of action that makes any sense or is comprehensible in any way. This movie, the entire movie, is cut together like a coming attractions trailer. Yes, no question. And it was bewildering. Or, or, or the TV it, ad for the film. It was aggressive and it was assaulting and it was too noisy. And I like The Rock. I gave The Rock thumbs oh, up. Okay. But this film, to me, doesn't have any kind of an arc or any kind of dramatic interest. And when it stops for drama, like when they're all saying goodbye to oh, each yeah, other, yeah. before you know, like seconds are ticking down. If they don't get that bomb ready in another 20 seconds, the earth ends, and they're saying goodbye to each other on television. Let, I couldn't understand that. Let me give people one piece of advice. If you go to a multiplex and it has Armageddon in it, do not go to a movie next door because oh, there will be two down. There will be tremendous audio bleed. It's, it's all yeah, yeah. and really, well, I, it, it was too much for me. I, I just felt that it was. Uh, but I was smiling. Our next film is Critters Two: The Main Course, a sequel to Critters One, which wasn't the main course. It was just an appetizer. But the appetizer is better than the main course because Critters One was a successful horror film from a couple of summers ago that had a nice little mean streak to it with alien fur balls with teeth wrecking havoc upon a small town. But whereas the first film had funny mean spirits to it, the sequel is routine. In fact, the critters themselves are the least interesting part of this picture, set years later in the same town where the critters are still on the attack. More interesting than the critters, who are just routine eating machines this time around, are a couple of alien bounty hunters who are assigned to come to Earth and destroy the little potent porcupines. aren't used enough in this film, which consists mostly of a relentless assault by the critters, as in this scene where a teenager who knows about the critters goes to warn a neighbor.
Now, the difference between Critters 1 and Critters 2, and aren't we glad that we're both in our 40s and we get to know the difference? Yes. The last time, Stephen Herrick, the director, presented the Critters as sort of mean little ETs, but this time it's virtually all chomp, chomp, chomp. And because we see the Critters early on, there's no mystery to hold our attention, as in the first film, and no personality in the Critters to generate any attention as the film progresses. Critters 2, another sequel failure. Well, here we're in agreement. I thought Critters 2 was really an extremely lame movie yeah. given the fact that they had a, a actually successful film to build on. Yeah. For one thing you can see at all times that the critters are basically Muppets. Mm -hmm. They're always chomping at things from behind things so you can almost see the operators behind there right. with the hands. Right. Secondly, you're right, they have no personality. Yeah. Third, there's an enormous dichotomy between the threat the critters represent and the casual well, I was just and badly I... written uh, behavior of the people in the town who right. just kind of mill around like some assistant director is telling yeah. them where to stand mm -hmm. next. They don't want to know, supposedly. They don't want to have it brought up in town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's such a desolate town because they couldn't afford <laughs> right. a very expensive town for this movie. Right. Who's going to come there and visit anyway? I say clean up the critters, clean up the town. Just like, remember in uh, Jaws 2, they didn't want anybody to know that 19 people have been eating on the right. beach last summer because yeah. it'll stop the condo yeah. sales? Word had gotten out, I think. Yeah, word got out. Right. Well, this town... Uh, actually Actually, it was improved by what the quitter. Jackson's critters. identified the seventh symbol. That's Egyptologist James Spader on the trail of a key to interplanetary travel in Stargate. A big, wobbly, wooden, old-fashioned science fiction piece, sort of lumbering, oafish, bloated adventure story we got 15 years ago in the backwash of the success of Star Wars. The story this time, there's been a discovery of an ancient stone carving that allows travel through space. In short order, Spader and a government security advisor, played by Kurt Russell, are preparing to explore a distant planet with a strange connection to ancient Egypt. the new planet, Spader is mistaken for a god. Wow, what a cliched scene. But the biggest disappointment and the biggest hoot in Stargate occurs when the leader of the planet, an alien masquerading as the sun god Ra, changes into human form. And guess who it is? You're not going to believe this. Jay Davidson from The Crying Game. <laughs> Eventually, there's a battle as the Earthlings prepare to leave the planet. Stargate reportedly was a very expensive film to make. I can't see it on the screen. What a waste. Here they find a gate that's going to allow them to travel, quote, to the other end of the known universe. Right. And so with about a week's preparation, some scientist who was a complete nut who nobody in his profession will listen to hooks up with six or seven guys with automatic machine guns and Kurt Russell and they walk through the Stargate. That would certainly be the way we would mount an expedition to the other side of the universe, right? And when we get there, what when are we, we going to do? There. We're going to shoot everybody. And I mean, meanwhile, nobody I'm... asks Spader. Spader says, oh yeah, I know how to get us back. And then they get to the other side without anybody having asked, well, how do you know how to get us back? Oh, I mean, getting back in time travel and space travel is always, always a big, yeah, uh, always right. badly handled in the movies. But if they went there, yeah. and if something were magical, couldn't something you go to the other side of the universe to have a gunfight? There you go. Amazing. Do you Amazing. know that the budget supposedly in this picture was fifty-five million dollars? Boy, they must have had some great lunches. What exactly do you want me to do for you, Angela? I don't know, Padre. I just want to go home to my village. There's nothing stopping you. The parties are looking for me, the police. Tom Berenger plays a priest protecting a woman who is being hunted by the mob in Last Rites, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Gene Sisko of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named Last Rites, and... That's exactly what I'd like to administer to this film, which is easily the most offensive big-budget picture of 1988. 
The movie stars Tom Berenger as a Catholic priest assigned to St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. Berenger's father is a mafia don, a godfather, and in the opening scenes of the movie, his sister, also a mafia insider, murders her husband and then comes to her brother in the confessional to ask for absolution. You didn't grant me absolution. Because you're not repentant. The confession was sacrilegious and I won't be found by it. I'm swearing to you in the presence of God that I am repentant. How dare you question my sincerity? Because I know you. No, he doesn't change our obligations. No, I regret my sins and I don't want absolution. If you won't grant it to me, I'll go to a priest who will. Barringer discovers that his murdered brother-in-law was having an affair with a Mexican woman played by Daphne Zuniga. At first, she doesn't realize that this priest is related to her dead lover. Gino? You know Gino? Don't bull me. I swear in the Madonna Padre, I don't know what you're talking you about. you didn't know who I was. Pace, you said your name was Father Michael Pace. In English, in Italiano, mi nombre se pronuncia Pace. Taking pity on this endangered woman, Beringer invites her to spend the night with him in his living quarters inside St. Patrick's Cathedral. A fellow priest is a little surprised. Angelo Martinez, Father Freddy. Hello, Father. Oh, my... God. And you might ask how a priest could live with a woman inside St. Patrick's Cathedral and not be noticed. I don't know. Would you ask that? I did was, you ask that question? I was, at that point, not interested in the movie enough to ask that you question. You did not ask that. Well, I, I, it occurred to me. But apparently there's only one other priest in the whole cathedral, and that's old Father Freddy there. Anyway, soon after the priest and the woman meet, early in the film, there's a scene that looks as if Beringer and Zuniga are making love. She gets up off the bed. She right. comes over to him. She takes off his Roman collar. They embrace. There's lots of sex. But actually, they're not really making love. You see, it's only a tempting dream. I think you could probably call it the last temptation of Beringer. But I don't want to blame the actors for this disgraceful film. How could they have possibly known that the writer and director, Donald P. Belisario, would pull off the neat trick of making a film that was both tasteless tasteless and senseless. The story is so ineptly told that most audiences will never figure out until way late in the film that Beringer even is the son of the Mafia leader. That exposition was not handled competently. It's a key thing and you don't know it. And as for the use of the Catholic Church in this movie, I for one am getting a little tired of seeing the vow of chastity and the sacrament of confession being used as cheap gimmicks by filmmakers who are so lacking in imagination that they have to trash somebody's religion to make a movie. Last rites is shameful. Uh, I thought it was also quite boring, uh, in, let's just mm -hmm. as a movie. Uh, okay. I'm tired, I suppose, too, of the whole business of hiding people in, uh, through the confession. We've seen that as a gimmick yeah. in a number of films. Uh, the Temptation of Priests, we've seen that. It's getting tired. Um, the characters weren't interesting. Tom Berenger is a very good actor. Mm -hmm. I I do hold these people responsible. You don't know what script they were given, Roger, so you can, really can't uh, absolve can't let them. let them off, you right? Can't, don't absolve them. I've seen Berenger in other good things. Yeah, I don't know. But, I, mean, don't I think that they kind of trust the director. You know, and he kind well, of I don't says, want to well, turn, we're going to handle this, you know. I don't want to turn, that's a debate that okay, we'll, well never we resolve. don't know, we don't The know, film okay. is not good. No. And it's de deadly dull, and you found it offensive. And you, I did find it offensive. You know, I haven't seen a priest in a movie in a long time who hasn't had... Uh, hey, this is like doctors. Priests are the only people left in the movies who have sex. Nobody I mean, else goes to bed with anybody. That's like uh, hospitals now. Everyone goes to hospital and dies. You right. used to be, get healthy kind in of the hospital. Yeah. This week is not very laughable either. It's a really offensive, tasteless, and artless piece of garbage named Caligula which was produced by the publisher of Penthouse Magazine, Bob Guccione. Caligula opened in New York eight months ago, but its distribution got held up by an obscenity trial in Boston, and it's only now going into national release. Caligula stars several prestigious British actors, John Gielgud, Peter O'Toole, Malcolm McDowell, but Gielgud and O'Toole are only on the screen for about 20 minutes, and I'll bet McDowell, <laughs> as Caligula, wishes he were too. That way, he wouldn't be apt to be in the rest of this violent, nauseating, and sickening mess the rewrites Roman history is a non-stop orgy of perversion and sadism. Andrew Marsh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Madonna is charged with murder, and Willem Dafoe is her defense attorney and body of evidence, a disappointing and disorganized new thriller that wants to be like basic instinct, but basically just stinks. It never makes the grade. In the movie, Madonna plays the kinky lover of an elderly millionaire, and when he dies, she's charged with murder. The murder weapon? Her own body. It's just too sexy.
Is it your sworn testimony that by coincidence alone you happened to date both Andrew Marsh, who died from a combination of sex and drugs, and the doctor who treated him for drug poisoning? Portland's a small city. I even dated a man who dated a woman you dated. The other suspect in the case, at least according to Madonna's lawyer, is the old man's secretary and former lover, played by Ann Archer. And did you tell your boss what you had seen? No. And why not? I wanted to keep my job. That didn't include telling him his girlfriend was a cokehead slut. The relationship between lawyer and client gets complicated when Defoe finds himself attracted to her and yet repelled by her promiscuity. Did you need to hear about every man I ever had sex with? No, just the ones with bad hearts who put you in their wills. Body of evidence ranks high in the sleaze department with so much kinky paraphernalia on hand that it looks like the outtakes from Madonna's recent sex book. But the movie never comes together. I didn't believe for a minute that anyone here truly believed their characters were real. The plot and the dialogue were way too ridiculous for that. And so many of the shots seem artificially abbreviated that maybe the filmmakers just got as impatient as I did. You know, when you say it stinks, uh, that's not a bad choice, not a glib choice. It does stink. Uh, Compare it to Basic Instinct and Sharon Stone. Looks good as a b credible character, mm -hmm. seriously. And the film was shot better, Basic Instinct. It had bright colors, I mean, bright, uh, impressive photography, mm -hmm. challenging. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is muddy, soft focus. Mm -hmm. She does not look sexy. She has a dumb hairdo that's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. I mean, here's one of the most exciting, charismatic talents on stage. And she does not come across. She's not photographed well. Uh, it makes no difference to us whether she is a killer or she is not a killer. We realize we're just there to watch a few the little things of, of dripping candle wax and, and having sex on broken glass, which yeah. we know is faked and staged, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a bad movie start to finish. You know, one of the things that bothered me was that a lot of the little stuff in the movie is sloppy. There's one point where one of the characters is dressing the jury, mm -hmm. and the focus is on a pretty girl in the front row of the jury box. And she looks at the lawyer with an unmistakable come-hither look, and I'm thinking, aha, plot point. We're going to meet this juror again later. <laughs> we never see her again. It's just bad direction to not handle yeah. your extras so they don't steal a scene right away from one of your stars. And surprising, it's Uli Adele who did a wonderful job with Last Exit yes, in Brooklyn. And yeah. There was some real passion there in some sexually uh, adventurous or risky or challenging mm -hmm. scenes. Not here. This movie, this and it's... Christopher Columbus, The Discovery, one of those bloated international movie productions with a big-name cast in small-time roles, and a glamorous new face named George Coraface as Columbus. Here Columbus makes his pitch to the Spanish king, Tom Selleck, looking quite silly, and Queen Rachel Ward looking very gaunt for some reason. Marlon Brando does not look gaunt as the Grand Inquisitor Torquemada in a walk-on role. Father Torquemada and I have uh, discussed the new evidences you have found from the Old Testament. But our world is largely land, and therefore the ocean sea cannot be as great as our scholars presume. Of course, Columbus gets his commission to sail, and then the movie runs through every standard seagoing movie cliche, including the false sighting of land. It's a cloud! It's a cloud. And the threats of mutiny. Portuguese. Are you alone, or are there others? Once on land, Columbus claims it for Spain and the glory for himself. We have landed in the Indies, my friend. My title is now Admiral of the Ocean Sea. This entire production is just too safe and homogenized. When the ships sail, it doesn't look majestic or all that dangerous. George Coraface, as Columbus is so handsome, he seems more like an underwear model than a <laughs> gutsy explorer. And Tom Selleck is truly silly as Ferdinand. Schoolboys may enjoy looking at all of the bare-breasted Indian women in the picture, but they won't learn much history from Christopher Columbus the movie. Yeah, you know, it's the old uh, technique in any of these movies that take place in some native island. You take the prettiest girl yes, with the largest uh, yes. cup size yeah. and you make her the queen's daughter and put her right in the front of every shot. Exactly. You know, Gene, were you any good at history in grade school? Did, uh, well, I'll get to my point. I, watching this movie, I realized that they have something in here where Columbus says, 
if we don't sight land in three days, you can behead me. And on the third day, there's no land, and he puts his head down, and the guy has the axe in the air. Yes. Now, it's funny that I don't remember that from my history <laughs> lessons. Is that, do you think that's well, factual? The, no, the only thing that I'm saying is that it seemed like he was taking a very short, a very big gamble. Yes, and he seemed very <laughs> cheerful, too. Yeah. He, was, he wasn't even nervous then, that morning. And then within the script, here's another problem. Yeah. He turns into a very bad guy all of a sudden. Yeah. Something had been chopped out of the movie uh -huh. because there's no setup. All of a sudden, he's a complete maniac uh, very late in the mm -hmm. picture as he's going back. Uh, to Spain. It, it, Another it, it, weak thing, I haven't seen a more lackluster Marlon Brando performance in, I can't sad. remember one. It was just sad. It was very sad. The sequel to the 12th top grossing movie of all time. How's that for a <laughs> trivia question? Saturday Night Fever, the story of a Brooklyn disco king who grows up out of his neighborhood and out of his friends. The new film is called Staying Alive, and it again stars John Travolta as Brooklyn boy Tony Manero, now living in Manhattan in a flea bag hotel, working part-time as a waiter, trying to get a job as a Broadway dancer. And one day while watching his girlfriend of his dance in a show, he spots another girl, the lead dancer, and he's drawn to her because she's more dangerous, more unattainable than his regular friend. You're going to audition, aren't you? Why not? And rejection's become like a hobby to me now. Oh, listen to you. <laughs> well, welcome. Good night. Good night. Good night. Well, now, the new film is sort of a rocky story in a leotard, and that makes sense because Staying Alive was co-written and directed by Sylvester Stallone. Unfortunately, Stallone simply doesn't understand what made this first film, the uh, Saturday Night Fever film, work so well. That film was about a character who danced. This movie is just about dancing, endless Broadway dancing that is a cut below anything I've ever seen on Broadway. Lost completely in this movie is the character of Tony Manero. This is supposed to be sort of a victory film for him, but Tony is lost in Manhattan and lost in all the dancing in this movie. Staying Alive, I'm afraid, is just another bad sequel. Well, you've taken care of Tony Manero. I agree with that. The character isn't there. This doesn't have any of the fire and the vigor and the human kind of feeling yeah. of his life in Brooklyn. Absolutely. The dancing is no good either. And Absolutely. I hate to say this, John Travolta is okay as a disco dancer but he's not a Broadway dancer, and they have to cut and cut to hide that fact in this movie. And mm -hmm. in particular, this is one of the first dance movies I've seen that's basically shot from the waist up. Mm -hmm. You don't see his feet, you don't see his legs. When, mm -hmm. he, da when he jumps, mm -hmm. he jumps over a stage that's covered with smoke, mm -hmm. or the camera is up above the stage so you can't see how high he's jumping. Mm -hmm. And then they use montages to try to create a feeling of movement that he can't give as a dancer. But test with me what's more important. Okay. If the character was there, and I think you know this is true, uh -huh. if the character were there, we frankly you wouldn't, wouldn't care. You wouldn't Care. You wouldn't notice. That's right. Because you would care about who's doing the dancing, mm -hmm. however well they do it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be great to be liked in the movies. I'm saying the structural flaw here is you have this wonderful, warm guy that we saw grow up with, mm -hmm. and it was a, a rough, R rated movie. Mm -hmm. This is just. PG Dazzle, and that's a bunch of star it's filters and smoke, and we lost all the gum cinematic jukebox. Absolutely. See yeah, the movie. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is Swing Kids, an all but inexplicable mixture of Nazi villains and teenage rebels. 
The movie takes place in Hamburg in 1939, where Hitler youth members roam the streets, beating up on Jews and anybody else who offends them. In that latter category are swing kids, German misfits who wear their hair long and dance to the forbidden rhythms of Benny Goodman, Duke Ellington, and Artie Shaw, musicians who are banned by the Nazis because they are Jewish or black. Swing kids reject the Nazis, although it's a little unclear early in the movie if it's because of politics or because they don't swing. Then they notice that one of their number has joined the other side. So it's true. Damn traitor. He was probably forced into it. It is compulsory after all. Eventually, two more swing kids are pressured into joining the Hitler Youth, and their friend, who has a crippled leg, is adamant in his opposition to the movement. Don't you have some marching to do? We didn't want to join. We had to. He had to. What's your excuse? Well, I'm his friend. So am I. You don't see me joining. No, they wouldn't accept you. What else about me do you have objections to? The film's hero is Peter, played by Robert Sean Leonard. He wears the uniform but hates the Nazis. And when his mother, played by Barbara Hershey, invites a top Nazi, played by Kenneth Branagh, to dinner, he pretends to be even more of a Nazi than the guest in order to embarrass him. What kind of loyal National Socialist would listen to anything else? I'm not heavy talking this way to our guest. You must apologize. At the end of Swing Kids, we get one of those title cards on the screen that informs us that although some Swing Kids were killed and others were pressured into joining the army and died, the movement did continue and there were Swing Kids, wow, even after the war. Well, la-di-da. What this movie does is find a tiny little social footnote in the midst of the unspeakable horror of Nazism and use it to make a movie that will possibly appeal to the youth market because these kids are rebels and swing music was, gee, it was almost as much fun as rock and roll. This movie dodges so many questions that I got dizzy just thinking of them. Swing Kids is more of an idea for a commercial movie than it is any kind of a statement about anything. You talked about... Uh, black people being uncomfortable in the last picture. We, what do you think Jewish people are going to feel like as they watch this movie? And I mean, this is a cataclysmic insult. And I'll tell you the way in which it operates in many ways. You notice they never showed any women or children being rounded up. Think about it. Only you saw a couple of men in brief little scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We didn't get to know any of these people. It's just a little. It's just like you know, Jews. It flash them quick, flash them quick. But yeah. it's kind of distasteful. So let's cut back to the dancing and swinging mm -hmm. and the movements of the kids on the street. I mean, that, to do that uh, about the Holocaust, it's, it's, now, you it's know, obnoxious. You know, frankly, I mean, I, there's one kid in the movie who's kind of heroic, Yeah. eventually. But frankly, most of these kids, if you get right down to it, they're not anti-Nazis. No. They're draft dodgers. <laughs> it's not so much they're against the Nazis as they're against having to cut their hair and they don't get to well, dance also, their favorite musicians As you anymore. pointed out, it was a very good line, they're pro-swing. They're not really that yeah, much. It's anti a really inexplicable film. Uh, a big, big oh, mistake. The Guardian, about a demonic babysitter who ends up terrorizing a yuppie couple and their baby boy. The babysitter is a descendant of the ancient druids who worshipped trees. She hopes to sacrifice the child to a tree. First, she has to charm the infant. And this is Jamara. And this. When the father suspects that the baby is in jeopardy, he confronts the babysitter, much to his wife's disapproval. I told you I wanted Dr. Klein to see him. He's perfectly fine. He had a lovely time, actually. Sure he had a lovely time. Babies always have a lovely time. He has a lovely time lying on the rug. Will you please stop shouting? What's going on here? The Guardian was directed by Bill Friedkin of The Exorcist fame, and it too has its supernatural moments as the father tries to rescue the baby from being sacrificed to a giant tree near his home. That's more silly than frightening, and The Guardian also is a routine police thriller after the couple has apparently killed the babysitter with their car. You saw the tree? Mm-hmm. The babies. You mean the carvings? They're not carvings. That's that's where she took the babies. She takes Mr. Them. Sterling, we didn't find her body. What? 
I don't think this plot works at all. I don't think it's at all important what this woman is going to do with the baby, so much for the story. On the movie level, the visuals aren't compelling either. The big tree is your standard horror movie tree with animated limbs. The couple is boring. The police are standard movie dullards who immediately take the side of the guilty. And the special effects from Bill Friedkin of The Exorcist, well, they're nothing that, shall we say, will turn your head. There's not much to like about The Guardian. You know, there is one area, though, Gene, where this movie breaks important new ground, and this is something that movie trivia experts Oh, you're should going study. to be funny now. Yes, I am. I'm going to be funny. <laughs> this is the first horror movie in which a chainsaw is used against a tree. <laughs> I understand. I mean, and then it spews out blood and all that. Now, so. Thank you for that enormous laugh of support well, there. It's not my that funny far. remark. You know, it's too bad about William Freakin, because here is an important director. To Live and Die in L.A., was a very, very French good French Connection, obviously. The French Connection. His last film, Rampage, which was never released, which I had an opportunity to see, was a true crime story. He was right at the top of his form. This man is making great movies that nobody sees. And then he, you know, probably because uh, he wanted to keep working, made a movie like The Guardian, which will get released and uh, won't do his, his uh, career or his reputation any good at all. There really isn't an element here that's compelling. I mean, you know, if the, uh, the Druids are supposed to be a threat uh, to us, I mean, The Exorcist, it was a real threat mm -hmm. uh, to the world. There's nothing going on here. I mean, we, we laugh at the tree. It, it just falls apart at every critical step. Yeah, it's just real hard to get involved with a babysitter that wants to sacrifice a baby. Our next film is called She's Out of Control, and like the movie Say Anything, which we reviewed earlier, She's Out of Control is about a beautiful teenage girl and her father and the boy she dates. But the similarity ends immediately because She's Out of Control quickly turns into a trashy TV-style movie that tries vainly to satirize its subjects. While the girl's father is out of town, she undergoes a beauty makeover that stuns her dad, Tony Danza, upon his return. That's right, Tony Danza plays a father here, and he plays one quite badly. Dad? Well, isn't it great? Janet, help me. Isn't she beautiful, Doug? Doug? Dad Danza tries to spend some time with his now popular daughter, and he discovers he has to make an appointment to see her. How's Thursday? Dad, I'm busy. I'm sorry. Friday. Dad, I can't. Saturday. Dad, I'm sorry. Sunday. Sunday, please. Give me Sunday. I want Sunday. What am I doing Sunday? Okay, okay, cancel it. Danza's voice is really grating, and in a typically exploitive scene, he becomes disturbed when he sees his voluptuous daughter at the beach. Dad, I'm dressed like everyone else. What's the matter with you? You're acting like every man on this beach is after my body. It's after my body. It's after my body. That's Amy Dolenz as the girl. Seeing she's out of control is really a depressing experience. It is neither lifelike nor an effective fantasy. That scene you just saw tries to rip off ten, but it isn't ten. Rather, this film exists in a strange netherworld, I think, of what Hollywood considers entertainment, but is really a sinkhole of tawdry values. The film is photographed ineptly in tight TV shots, and when I saw She's Out of Control, I became so depressed I actually thought about quitting my job as a film critic, feeling as though the movies had abandoned me, because what I was seeing there really wasn't a movie. It was some sort of strange concoction of uh, really this, someone who didn't understand what movies were all about. Fortunately, however, I would see the movie say anything later in the same day, and all is right with the world. I'm still on the job. You know, people probably think you're joking when you said no, you I meant, were really I thinking that. of quitting your job, but I know what you felt, because I sat there and I thought, Life is precious, life is short, and the idiots who made this film are taking two hours of my life and robbing it from me in order to give me less than nothing. Yeah. I mean, a movie like this is a crime because what it does is it robs life from people by requiring them to spend two hours having such a terrible experience happen to them. Now, yeah. Jean-Luc Godard, the great French director, right. once said, the way to criticize a movie is to make another movie, and you put your finger right on it mm -hmm. because the next movie we saw the same day was Say Anything, mm -hmm. also about a father also about his daughter. Right. Same kind of basic situation, but here's a trash movie and here's a great movie. Uh, it's really bad. I always wonder when I'm in a bad, I don't know if you have this reaction, when I'm in a bad movie in a theater, mm -hmm. uh, aren't you surprised that people stay? I think maybe they're just, they've spent their money, but they don't about, have any place to go for two hours. Yes, but I would say this, when you talk about robbing your life, see my thing I've always wanted to say to people, I've always wanted to stand up in the middle of a bad movie in uh -huh. a theater and say, aren't your lives worth more 
for two hours than the even say seven bucks in New York City. Oh, Stan, three fifty an hour. Every, that's below the minimum wage, the new minimum wage. I mean, <laughs> get out and live. Go up. stand in the lobby and talk. Yeah. You know, Oscar Brotman, a Chicago film exhibitor, once told me many years ago. He said, "There's a rule." He said, "If nothing has happened by the end of the first reel." Nothing is going to happen, yeah. you know. And when I saw uh, this movie, I oh, knew it was... that I, after the first minute, I knew that nothing. Yeah. Was... It is the water that you show to your place. Uh -huh. It is imperative that you allow me to be your water boy. I can't hire you. Adam Sandler has been fired as the water boy of a championship team and offers his services in that scene to a losing and very neurotic coach played by Henry Winkler. That's from The Water Boy. The film is set in Louisiana where Sandler's character is portrayed as a dim-witted mama's boy from the bayou. Hey, but I got friends, mama. I just want some, too. You don't have what they call the social skill. My name is Bobby Bougie. It turns out that the water boy is a ferocious runner and blocker if he gets worked up enough. But what gets him worked up? The coach suggests a little creative visualization. What's the matter with you, boy? You too stupid. Stupid to do what your coach tells you? <laughs> no. No what? <laughs> the Water Boy is a profoundly conventional movie for every frame of its length. Every single minute turn and twist of the plot has been foreordained in countless other stories, and the underlying sports movie formula leads relentlessly up to the big game. How much suspense can there really be about who's going to win that big game? Kathy Bates has fun with her role as a mommy dearest of the bayou, but Adam Sandler finds one note for his performance and plays it again and again and again. It's the kind of movie you might like if you're a little kid, say, nine or under. I felt kind of sorry for you having, and I'm stunned at the exposition you have given to this movie, that you even wasted the breath on this picture that you did. Oh, it's, it's comes to the territory, it's, Gene. It's my job. But, Roger, it's junk. I mean, and also, Adam Sandler is annoying with his, you know, fake speech impediment, whatever he's doing in this. I can't even, I wouldn't replicate it, but I mean, we've seen it in the clips. But uh, is that supposed to be funny? I mean, in other words, the physical humor we know, but is his voice supposed to be funny? I don't think that it if is. If they're going to venture into this material at all, they're going to have to go over the top with it. I mean, why make it conventional? Why not? I mean, Kathy Bates has pointed in the right direction, you know. Just go right out there into well, American Gothic, 100%, no holds barred, you know, an and go for it. Yeah, has but, some pride but in why play this story. Okay, next movie, and our next film is something I was really looking forward to. It's titled an Alan Smithy film, Burn, Hollywood, Burn. And a not-so-little explanation is required for that title. Alan Smithy is a fictitious name that was selected 28 years ago in Hollywood to stand in as the name of a director in the credits for a movie when the real director wanted his name taken off the film for any reason, usually because he was in conflict with the producer or the studio about how the film was being edited. The controversial screenwriter, Joe Esterhaas, a macho character who has scripted such films as Showgirls, Basic Instinct, and Jagged Edge, decided to vent his spleen against Hollywood by intentionally creating an Alan Smithy movie just to show how badly writers and directors are treated. And he even creates a fictional director whose name is really Alan Smithy, played by Eric Idle. And here we see him go ballistic in an editing room. It's awful. It's terrible. You, you've sodomized it. Sodomized it? What the f*** are you talking about? I don't, I don't do that stuff. Please, James, I beg you, my name's on this movie. Well, you know what? Take your name off it. You can use Alan Smithy. Oh! I'm Alan Smithy. Yeah, you and hundreds of others. Oh, Alan Smithy is so angry with the studio, he decides to steal the final print of his movie, and that stuns his filmmaking colleagues. The Brothers Brothers, that's a funny name, played by rappers Coolio and Chuck D. If we believe in film, and we do, then don't we have a responsibility to protect the world from bad ones? Is the movie really that bad? It's horrible. It's worse than Showgirls. It's worse than Showgirls? The story of Alan Smithy and his very bad movie gets him a spot on The Larry King Show. I ended it suffering. I, I ended the suffering of others who would have had to watch it. This was then a uh, humanitarian gesture. Please God it was. This is an inside Hollywood story to be sure. And the more you know about the movie biz, the more jokes you will get. But I got most of them and I still didn't laugh. Esther Haas set out to be so mean 
that he didn't write anyone we care about. Compare this film to the much superior Barton Fink by the Coen brothers, which was also about how creative types are treated in Hollywood. But Barton Fink, as a talent, meant something. As a character, he was interesting. Alan Smithy in this movie, by comparison, is a true non-entity. Well, I didn't laugh either, Gene, and I would also compare it to Robert Altman's great movie, The Player, sure. which takes Hollywood and dices it up and yep. slices it three different ways as compared to this film, right. which is just mean-spirited. Exactly. And uh, also, not at all interesting to watch, even in the moment. It's done as kind of in the style of one of those tributes where somebody with a camera goes around to get everybody to yeah. say, uh, happy retirement to the boss or something. Everybody's looking straight at the camera. There's no character development. They tell the story in order. It's it's not only not funny, but it's boring and excruciating to sit through. It's because Esther Haas has a private agenda. His anger got the best of him. He didn't have any satiric distance on this material. I never know what to wear. Yeah, it must be really hard for you, Victoria. You know, trans decides whether to wear the little Gucci dress, the little Gucci dress, or the little Gucci dress. The Spice Girls make their screen debut in Spice World, one of six new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Spice World, and there is an honored tradition of rock and rollers appearing in some awfully good movies early on in their careers, films that capture and amplify the spirit of the performers. I'm thinking, of course, of Jailhouse Rock with Elvis Presley, A Hard Day's Night with The Beatles. Well... Sorry, Spice World is not in that league, hardly. Of course, neither are the Spice Girls, the so-called prefab five. Five singers with different looks, packaged much like the monkeys and given musical support. Here's a scene from Spice World where we first meet them and witness their celebrity. And compare this with the excitement of seeing the Beatles chased by fans at the beginning of A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> There isn't much of a story here. The girls and their roles are identified and re-examined while on a concert tour. Come on, what's it like to be Baby Spice? You know, I'm always going to be seen as Baby Spice, you know, the sweet and innocent one. Even when I'm 30. You love it? Really, Emma? You play up to it all the time. No, I don't. Much is made of the girls' motto, girl power, but we don't have much of a rooting interest in that because their power is not threatened in any significant way in this lightweight film. The driving force of this screenplay, if you can call it that, is to show the girls, have them make a few jokes at each other's expense, sing a little, and say goodbye. <laughs> Spice World is a half-hearted effort, a blown opportunity to make a spicy film. Well, Gene, uh, taking a page from your book at about this time last year, I would like to announce that I have now seen the worst movie of 1998. Wow. Wow. This movie stinks. It is an entertainment-free dead zone, as far as I'm concerned. I'm trying to think if I'm going they, to settle for this is a good year. If that's they, <laughs> they can't even lip-sync to their horrible music successfully. Yeah. They And at one point, they're changing costumes. You realize that they could change names and identities. There is nothing at all that is distinctive about them. And more to the point, nothing distinctive about the screenplay. It, oh, in no, other words, no. you can't change their talent. The but screenplay the, the, is like, let's take a hard day's night and make it as bad as we can. Yeah. That was basically <clears throat> It's getting out. And he wanted me to personally thank you for keeping this girl uh, company while he was gone. My pleasure. Vic, the big gang boss, is coming back after spending time in a mental institution, and that's of interest to his second-in-command, played by Gabriel Byrne, and his hitman, played by Jeff Goldblum, in that early scene from Mad Dog Time. And because it is still early in the movie, it's of interest to us, too, until the sinking realization sets in that every single scene in this movie is going to be more or less exactly like that one. Here's another example. As Mick the Enforcer faces down Nick, a killer. Both Mick and Nick hope to take over for Vic. This is the part where you're plugging me once in the belly. Uh, but then you're going to waste two more shots with... Uh, this sh shattering of the shin. Wow, wouldn't it be better to, to, uh, to bury a bunch of bullets in my belly and skip that second part of the first part, go right into the first part of the second part, that, uh, you know, a bit with the booze business, and then the, then the blowing out of the brain's bullet. 
But that turns out not to be the real Nick. Later, Mick meets the real Nick, while Vic's girlfriend, played by Diane Lane, and Goldblum's sometimes girlfriend, played by Ellen Barkin, look on. Oh, and here's Vic, played by Richard Dreyfus. Ben has just threatened to take over the mob. He did my way with special lyrics. Now Vic does it his way. I judge a man's life by the way he dies, Ben. Your life was uh, one note. Mad Dog Time starts out with the information that it takes place in a parallel world on the other side of the universe. That's not far enough away for me. Scene after scene simply consists of characters standing around and talking tough before somebody gets shot to death. How in the world did anyone think this would be watchable, let alone entertaining? This movie is a humorless, witless exercise in pointlessness and a complete waste of the time and talent of the big cast of big names. I was shocked oh, by this absolutely film. Absolutely true. In fact, I think we'll be referring to this film in January when we do that list. Uh, the worst list. Of oh, the absolutely Yes, I think right. it will That's have a list. place of honor on that list. Um, I was kind of stunned, too. Um, Richard Dreyfuss I, is listed as one of the executives involved in this, a producer of some sort in this picture. What did he find in this material? I don't have a clue. Did he like walking through as some kind of mafia don uh, who's, you know, had uh, mental problems and just getting out? Did he like walking through in a bathrobe? Uh, what drew all these other talents? These are know. big talents. These are know. quality They're actors. I have no people. idea. Maybe they all got hallucinating uh, after a screening of Usual Suspects and thought, the screenplay had some similarity to it. That's I what would I... have loved to have been at the pitch meeting. Okay. I would have loved to hear the I pitch. Put it... Somebody's going to spend millions yeah. of dollars on this picture. What do you tell them? Okay. How can you convince them there's anything in this movie that anybody I'm wants gonna tell to you. see? I think you put your finger on it when you said usual suspects, and I'm going to cite Reservoir Dogs. I think this is a bunch of 40 to 50-year-old guys thinking, hey, here's the way the world's going with Tarantino, so we're going to make one, too. It'll work. This is what people want, and they have sold themselves out and... Leave, leave us with a bum movie. Come here, Miss Rash. You see it? Him, mole, men. There's no ointment. Yeah, so let me Not tell you. So let me remind you who you're talking to. <laughs> Only this year's recipient of the coveted Mr. Inseam Award. <laughs> well, that shut him up. <laughs> a boy played by Elijah Wood gets fed up with his folks in that scene from North and decides that since they don't pay attention to him, he will divorce him and go looking for a new set of parents. And that's the setup for one of the most thoroughly hateful movies of recent years, a movie that makes me cringe even when I'm sitting here thinking about it. Look at this scene, for example, where young North is in court trying to dump his parents who are comatose with shock. And there's nothing left for me to do but make my judgment. And in my judgment, any folks who would sleep through a trial like this are folks who don't deserve to have a wonderful, upstanding son like North. Then there's a series of auditions as would-be parents from around the country try out for the role of North's new mom and dad. Dan Aykroyd and Reba McIntyre are a couple of absurd Texans who want to adopt him. We had a son who was trampled by a ton of longhorns. But you're here cute to fill his boots as flat as they may be. Next stop, the Hawaiian Islands, where we get some amazingly tasteless dialogue about why these two people don't have children. Hawaii is a lush and fertile land. In fact, there's only one barren area on all of our islands. Unfortunately, it's Mrs. Holt. A mysterious character keeps turning up on North Travels. He's played by Bruce Willis as an Easter Bunny, a Western ranch hand, a beachcomber, and a Federal Express driver who gets in lots of product plugs. What are you, some kind of guardian angel? Well, I guess you can say that. Because in a manner of speaking, we at Federal Express feel that we are guardians. Guardians of your most important packages and priority communicate. I hated this movie as much as any movie we've ever reviewed in the 19 years we've been doing this show. I hated it because of the premise, which seems shockingly cold-hearted, and because this premise is being suggested to kids as children's entertainment, and because everybody in the movie was vulgar and stupid, and because the jokes weren't funny, and because most of the characters were obnoxious, and because of the phony attempt to add a little pseudo-hip philosophy with a Bruce Willis character. Now, I think Elijah Wood is a fine young actor, and of course, Rob Reiner, the director, has made one terrific movie after another, so I prefer to consider North as just a very unfortunate aberration in these otherwise admirable careers. Well, I mean, I think you got to hold uh, Rob Reiner's feet to the fire here. I mean, he's the guy in charge. He's saying that this is entertainment. It's uh, deplorable. I mean, it's, there isn't a gag that works. 
You couldn't write worse jokes if I told you to write worse jokes. And of course, jokes. you could always. The ethnic stereotyping is appalling. Yes. It's it's embarrassing. You feel unclean as you're sitting there. Mm -hmm. It's junk. First class junk. And then the idea that kids might be lured in by television ads to see this movie oh, about a little child who, you know, throws away his parents right. and goes shopping for a new set. It's really. Any subject could be done well. This is just trash, Roger. Oh.